Good evening, everyone. A very warm welcome from me too, although in Athens it's anything but warm at the moment, I gather. It's not very warm where I am either. But I think there's a warm atmosphere um, amongst the speakers, and I hope uh, that we're going to have a, a very uh, enjoyable discussion. We have three speakers, in fact. Uh, the first is uh, Claire Haywood, who is a graduate of the University of Warwick. Uh, she got a first in classical civilization and then went on to do an MA in ancient visual and material culture. Um, her first novel, Daughters of Sparta, which I'm holding up now, um, was published last year and uh, it's already had a notable success. It's been translated into Czech and Spanish and five other translations are in the offing. Uh, and the second novel is also in the pipeline. It has the title, The Shadow of Perseus, and that's due for publication uh, next year. Our second speaker is Mika Provata Carlone, who is an independent scholar, a translator, editorial consultant, illustrator, and literary critic. Uh, among her academic fields are classics and reception studies, philosophy, history of art, English and French literature, European studies, film and drama. That's enough to be going on with, I think. She has degrees from a number of universities, Athens, the Sorbonne, Sussex, where she did an MA, and Princeton, where she did an MA and also completed her PhD. Uh, she has uh, produced translations. Here is one, a rather famous book uh, to those who are familiar with Greek literature. It's by Pinalopi Delta. Uh, and in Greek, it's Paramithi Horis Onoma, translated as a tale without a name. Um, Mika has, uh, is also a contributing editor to the literary magazine Bukanista, and she has various other projects uh, on the go at the moment. Our third speaker uh, is uh, Haris Saras. He's published uh, five books of poetry and also contributed poems, translations, and essays to journals, and he's edited a number of volumes. Translations of his work have appeared in anthologies and periodicals in Europe and America. Most recently, he was responsible for translating uh, the poem Ariadne uh, by the winner of last year's Michael Mark's Greek Bicentennial Prize. So he's also a translator. Harris studied law at Athens and Oxford and also Edinburgh. He has taught at law at the University of Cambridge and he's currently a lecturer in law at the University of Southampton. That then is the lineup of speakers. I'm going to ask them each now to speak uh, for five to 10 minutes uh, to present their views on the subject of uh, exclusion and inclusion in relation to translation. So we'll begin with Claire, over to you. Thank you, David. Um, well, naturally my contribution to this discussion concerns a, a slightly looser definition of translation, um, largely fiction, broadly speaking, or more specifically novels as a way of translating uh, classical texts um, and ancient sources. Um, as David said, my first novel was published last year, Daughters of Sparta, um, and in simplest terms, it's a, it's a retelling of the Trojan War myths um, from the perspective of Helen and Clytemnestra. Um, it follows them from childhood in Sparta, through marriage um, and motherhood, and then from the inception of the Trojan War through to its consequences and aftermath. Um, when I set out to write this novel, I was very conscious that I wanted to both create a novel that would be an interesting response to the ancient sources that I had studied as part of my academic life, but also a novel that would be accessible to a general reader, 
Um, so I always bore these two audiences in mind when I was um, writing, um, essentially so that the story would be interesting, both coming at it with fresh eyes, um, I think in, in a more immediate sense that you are just following the characters at, on their journey and experiencing all the, the revelations of that story as they are revealed to the characters. And then the other reading, of course, if you're already aware of the, the greater context of those stories um, is much fuller with um, foreboding and um, has, a, has a larger subtext going on as well in the background. And I didn't think that either of those readings would be superior to the other. I was just conscious that I would have both of those readers in mind. Um, my novel is not a, a standalone. It's sort of part of a trend that's been taking off um, in the last few years, uh, particularly from female novelists. There's been quite a few um, reimaginings of Greek myth from female perspectives. Um, in particular, Madeline Miller's novel, Circe, was very successful. That was published in 2018. There's also been um, a novel called Ariadne by Jennifer Saint, which came out last year, a similar time to mine. Um, also, uh, A Thousand Ships by Natalie Haynes, and Silence of the Girls and Women of Troy by Pat Barker. So you can see that it, just within the last few years, there's been quite a trend for this type of reception of ancient stories. Um, and I think that that is uh, a positive trend. It's, it's interesting in terms of when we talk about inclusivity and exclusivity in that I think it's maybe bringing in new audiences to classics and classical texts um, who might have struggled to find interest in them if it wasn't um, presented in this slightly different perspective, um, particularly through a, a feminist lens and picking out the, the stories that have more female input and female interest um, when a lot of the most famous sources and particularly reception of those sources in Hollywood films is often male dominated and it's about you know Greek warriors and Roman gladiators and that sort of thing. Um, I think it's interesting that we've got a slightly different um, take on those stories that's potentially appealing to a slightly different audience. Um, it also seems quite popular with a with a young audience. Um, I know that these these uh, books have been particularly popular on um, services like TikTok, uh, where young people share things that they're interested in, um, particularly Madeline Miller, a lot of her recent success has been credited to um, videos on TikTok um, of people saying how much they enjoyed her books and it takes off with a, a younger generation in that way. And I can say anecdotally um, from my own experience that a lot of the, the readers that have got in touch with me to say that they enjoyed my book have been teenagers, you know, sitting their A-levels or similar age to that. Um, so it's also interesting to bring in a, a younger audience. Um, and I think that it's not really a new thing to have these reimaginings of, of ancient texts. It's just a way of keeping them fresh and engaging and accessible, um, which is in essence what classics is. I mean, it's been happening for millennia. This is just a new medium that's on trend right now. But I mean, as I mentioned before, it's it's been in Hollywood and video games and all sorts of different media. Um, and I, I think that that is only positive in, in increasing the awareness of the general public of um, classics um, and its, its content that might not access it otherwise. Um, and on that, on that theme, I actually wanted to mention my own sort of journey to classics um, because I, I don't have a particularly typical background perhaps for a, a classics graduate. Um, I, I attended a school, uh, just a, a state school that was struggling considerably um, and didn't have any classics on the curriculum. So my only awareness of classics came through um, mainstream media through films or reading children's books about Greek mythology or um, yeah, other things that I mentioned, video games or visiting museums, all of those things that are accessible to, to the general public. Um, and even through that limited exposure without any formal exposure, 
I got enough of a sense of the subject that I thought I wanted to commit to, to studying that university and then went on to, to complete a master's in the subject as well. So I think we shouldn't underestimate these sort of non-academic media in promoting all of the things that classics can be, all the interest that it can hold, and then also spur people on to then study it in, in more depth and perhaps more formally, um, having been exposed to more informal sources at the beginning. Um, I think those are the main points that I wanted to, to raise, um, really. But if, if anyone has any further questions, obviously, I'd be happy to, to discuss those in the Q&A. Thank you very much, Claire. We're going to have the, the three speakers' uh, contributions first of all, and then we'll move on to uh, discussion later. But this gives me the opportunity to remind everyone that they can, at any point during the proceedings, put their questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Um, it's completely empty so far, but I hope it will steadily fill up as, as we progress. So over now to our second speaker, Mika Provata Carloni. Mika. Thank you so much, David. Um, Claire, just a thought. I loved your ideas about classics. Classical reception is what I do. And in fact, the whole notion of translating has to do with carrying meaning across, carrying meaning across languages, human experiences, time, cultures, especially across ways of seeing and perceiving the world. And I thought the way you, you sort of framed the, the value of an older tradition to have resonance throughout time in many different ways and for tradition to grow, to be dynamic, not to be static, I, th I thought that was perfect. Um, my brief from David was to try and find a way to speak about translating children's books and the relationship between translation and inclusion and exclusion as far as um, children's books are concerned. And my, thought was, were that, my thoughts were that at the very start of our lives, namely childhood, existence itself is all one vital act of translation in order to acquire language, in order to understand the very function of meaning and the relationships and relation, relationalities that it depends upon. Everything that constitutes human belonging and being in the world must be translated across images, across words, or across gestures. Significance itself, communication, social existence, and identity are created through a series of literal or metaphorical translations. In order to be included in the world, in order to belong to oneself, one must engage with translation from the very day one is born. Not to do so is almost a guarantee exclusion, erasure, or even non-existence. And I was, as I was thinking about this, um, the Jungle Book actually came to mind, um, because I think that Rudyard Kipling perhaps illustrated the question better than many. In his tale or parable of Mowgli, he tests the very notion of inclusion and, in and exclusion when it comes to language and translation. He radically questions and reverses notions of centers and margins, outsiders and agents. At the primary level of translation, of belonging through the sharing and exchange of meaning, Mowgli is excluded or included in human or animal society in accordance with the gestures of translation he can or is willing to make, and vice versa. The human or animal society excludes or includes him in accordance with the gestures of translation it in turn is willing to make. For children reading the story, the effect has both tremendous intimacy and even terrifying poignancy. Um, translation, when it comes to children, does not only transfer something, meaning or socio historical or cultural experience, the very experience of meaning from one place to another, it actually creates a very space for all this to happen at all. Children's books themselves, even in their original source language, are in fact translators, paraphrasing, metaphorizing, transsentencing, and transmitting human news, the mind and thoughts and concepts, and practice from old to young, from Daphina to Al Capo. They translate material to spiritual, literal to symbolic, metaphorical and imaginative, the factual statement to the creative interpretation, the individual experience to relatedness, to empathy, sympathy, understanding. They animate through words or images the promise and potential of being human in the world. 
children's books, in fact, can make or break a world, human or otherwise, through the mere act of how they translate things to young minds. To translate children's books, as I found, um, not to my detriment, I hope, is no mere child's play. It involves an understanding of children's relationship to language, not only in terms of vocabulary or syntactical complexity, but especially in terms of their experience of language and of the formidable power and enchantment of words. Also, and especially in terms of children's sheer determination to understand and to be understood. A translation that achieves that osmosis between the child and the world of the text and beyond is one that offers a new place of inclusion one that alienates or falsifies, perforce excludes the child not only from one particular tale or story, and that again picks up points that you made clear, but perhaps even from the possibility of belonging to a narrative at all. The choice of what children's books to translate is as decisive, to look at what books were translated for and were therefore transmitted to children at any given time can be a lesson in anatomy of a particular historical or social, social moment. We can build cultural and social polyphony, or we can impose monochromic erasure or two-tonal polarity simply by the very act of what a child's man, mind can see as the accepted reality at any given time, what dialectics it can engage in. Children thirst to know, to know themselves, to know one another and to know others. They know that words are their very special force and it is absolutely extraordinary to see the transition between a non-verbal toddler frustrated because it does not have the words to say it, the words to translate to you what it wants and feels and a young child relishing words smithery to the most extravagant degree. For me, proper translating, um, let me just try and do this, hold on. Um, let's... I'm going to try and share a screen, forgive me for a second. Um, it should be. Hold on. Okay, I don't seem to be. That's um, fine, Nico, we can see it. No, I'm trying to share a different screen. Give me just one second. If you click on the image and then. Yeah. Use the arrows to go up, should. I don't see it be, oh. E. Okay. It doesn't seem to be working, so. How could, Dave, um, how could I exit the, um, the full screen? Because then perhaps What's I can get. Oh, there you go. No, it's a different. Mm. Okay, press escape. Okay. Top left. There we go. That's it. Can you see this one? Is it a different one? Yep. Yep. Okay. So for me, proper translating of children's books started with reselling as in the Dutch word for translating, fair telling, the English, Greek or German text of pictures books to my daughter who started off with French as a first language. And my first published translation of a children's book was Penelope Delta's A Tale Without a Name, which I had translated for her so she could read it on her own. She asked for pictures, so pictures were added to the text, and then it was sent um, for submission once it received her full approval to Pushkin Press. And the reason that book was very special to me was that Delta is a writer who broke very real ground when it comes to inclusion, whether in terms of national stories, histories, religious or cultural or social identities, or the place of women in society. Um, another children's book that marked me as a translator, this time not in terms of language, but in terms of images, was the other screen I was trying to share. Um, the Whale That Fell in Love with a Submarine by Nosaka Akiyuki which I was asked to illustrate again for Pushkin Press. Akiyuki seeks to translate into stories the experience of war as endured and filtered by children in Japan. And if you look at the images, um, they're quite strong. The stories bring together horror, brutality, a scathing political critique, the most fragile human intimacy and the despair of hope. Akiyuki's stories were actually a translation into 
of 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 all those experiences into um, of what it meant to be a child in Japan at the time, both helpless and forced to to experience and to witness all these things, and translating in turn those stories into pictures that would be true to the words, but also right for children's eyes was one of the most difficult and meaningful translation projects I have ever been assigned. And again, I think that is um, translation. You, you started off, Claire, by saying that there is a loose sort of um, interpretation of translation. Translation in itself is a gesture that covers absolutely everything. And the way we, we can relate to it is perhaps the most fundamental way that we build a society. We translate and we transmit and we create the space for that dialecticity that is so essential. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mika. There are lots of thought-provoking ideas uh, there for us to discuss later. Our third speaker now, uh, Haris Saras, your turn. Thank you, David, <clears throat> for the invitation to participate in this uh, workshop. And um, thank you, Mika and Claire, for your talks, um, which um, I found very interesting. And many thanks um, to colleagues and friends who are with us um, this evening. Um, I would like to make some comments on what makes translation in poetry uh, different to translation in other literary genres. Um, and I would like to, to tie this topic to the consideration of translation as um, a balance between, a striking a balance between inclusion and exclusion um, as the title of the um, event tonight is. Um, I think a good point to have in mind when we consider um, translation in poetry is that uh, poetry can be generally uh, juxtaposed to uh, most other literary genres in the sense that uh, most other literary genres are uh, prose in one or another way was poetry uh, stands separately in some respects. And I think the distinguishing feature of poetry is possibly that um, it, it's a form of literary expression or a type of literary speech that has some distinctive elements that are not present. Uh, in, in other literary genres that would be sort of classified under the category of prose. I think some of these uh, distinctive elements of poetry are particularly interesting when it comes to the translation of poetry. So generally when we talk about the elements of poetry, we would think of uh, traditional um, concepts such as diction and imagery and rhyme and meter, um, and other elements of poetry. I'd like to uh, draw um, your attention to some key elements that, as I said, have a role to play when it comes to trans translating poetry. The first is um, what we can describe as uh, the sonic elements of poetry or the sonorant elements of poetry, sometimes described as form, that would include meter, rhyme, or the rhythm of verse in um, more ordinary uh, poetry nowadays, when often poetry is written without meter and verse, uh, sorry, without meter and rhyme. Uh, it's quite essential to retain at least an echo of these uh, sonorant elements of the original, I believe, when we translate a poem into another language. But that is not always easy because it may come uh, with a cost when it comes to retaining some other key elements. And I'm moving now to the other two key elements that I believe have a role to play when it comes to 
poetry and translation. The second uh, key element I would say is what is normally described as the cognitive or semantic element of poetry, uh, which can be, you know, a simpler term described as the ideas or the content of a poem, not necessarily the meaning, because for some people, form and content together produce the meaning of a poem. So uh, obviously it's important to retain uh, this cognitive or semantic element, the ideas of the poem, uh, of the poet, the content uh, of a poem, but it's not always as straightforward as it seems, because often in poetry we have uh, a pretty high level of abstraction in expression or metaphorical use of the language, or also a density in terms of expression that opens the scope for interpretation very, very much in comparison to other types of speech. And therefore the uh, translator has um, to make some uh, choices to make uh, his or her own interpretation of the original and then try to transmit that um, in the uh, language, uh, the new language of his or her translated uh, poem. And that um, can um, come uh, occasionally uh, in sort of a competitive relationship with the uh, wish of a translator to retain the sonic elements that I described later, uh, earlier. The final key element I would say has to do with what we can uh, describe as um, the oral element of language uh, in poetry, uh, the vernacular, the idiomatic, the fact that uh, poetry is mostly uh, written, not just to be read or not primarily to be read, but mostly in terms of it being with, with the intention of it being recited or shared with others uh, in a relatively vocal manner. Uh, now, uh, more recently, we have also the element of performance um, in, in poetry, which uh, emphasizes this old tradition of um, poetry being um, an orally formed uh, type of literary speech and poetry being intended to be, uh, poems being intended to be read aloud. And that means that often language in poetry has a strong element, as I said, of um, idiomatic uh, use of the language uh, with the ordinary expressions that reflect a specific linguistic uh, culture, a specific tradition are very present in the poem itself and would ideally be transmitted uh, in the translated poem. But that, of course, again, is not easy if we consider that uh, as a matter of transmission as we uh, heard earlier also by Mika, but I think that was as an idea present also in class, uh, talk as a transmission from one culture to another, from one sort of uh, way of expressing ourselves as part of a community and, and another uh, way of expressing ourselves as part of a different community. So I think those are the three elements that we can possibly have in mind. Also remembering that uh, these three elements uh, are intended to be balanced against each other uh, along a spectrum which has in its two ends uh, the poet, the writer of the original, and then the translator who um, ideally would like to be a poet himself or herself as well in making this transition from one language to another in the sense that the intention of a translator in poetry would be to recreate the poem in a new language and in this way regardless of whether he or she writes poetry um, or in original uh, terms as well, uh, would act as a poet uh, through a translation. Um, so I think it's, um, it's time to um, conclude now. Uh, thank you for listening and I look forward to uh, discussion and your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Harris. Um, I'd like to ask uh, each of the three speakers now, um, well, I, I, I pose it in the form of a question to all of you, but uh, please let's, let's have a, a dialogue. Um, on the phrase inclusion versus exclusion, which uh, the whole of this uh, event is supposedly uh, dedicated to, it, it comes up in all of your uh, presentations in one way or another. 
Um, and I think you've all um, focused to, to an extent on the reader, uh, for, uh, uh, the reader you're aiming at when you uh, translate or, or when you um, put mythology into a, a, a new uh, genre, a new form. Um, when you aim at a particular readership, uh, you have a readership in, in mind, um, how do you deal with the problem of excluding other potential uh, readers? Could I put that question to all three of you and perhaps one of you would like to start the ball rolling? Um, I, I would say that my approach is more to do with making the, the potential readership as broad as possible, which largely means removing any unnecessary barriers. Um, for example, I, I write in quite plain English. That doesn't mean that the text has to be plain or dumbed down, but it's just you don't need to create barriers through the language that you're using. Um, and that goes for specialist language as well, because obviously we're translating a different culture with sometimes quite specific terminology. I try as far as possible not to include that if I could um, translate it in a way that is easier to understand where the reader wouldn't have to then go away and Google what this very specific aspect of the culture means. They can understand it through the context of the story that you're telling. Um, so that, that would be my main response. I think it's more rather than catering to someone, it's more avoiding um, barriers that would exclude any particular reader, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so uh, this sort of ties in with um, what Harris was saying uh, about uh, balance of the, the various uh, aspects of, of poetry that have to be uh, rendered um, in one way or another. There is, uh, in, in your case, an attempt to broaden your readership as much as possible. And uh, in a sense, that also applies to poetry. I wonder if censorship, self-censorship comes into play here too. I'm thinking of that particularly in relation to children's literature, um, Mika. Uh, do you yeah. ever feel it, it's necessary to censor? So um, there are two things with children. With it, with children's literature, there is a very different, well, not necessarily all literature has as purpose, not just to appeal to the broadest audience possible, but also to broaden the space to which that audience has access. So there are, there are two sort of broadening processes that are going on. Um, and with children in particular, what you're trying to create is a room with a multitude of windows. Their world, instead of being a single space with a unilateral direction of vision, you're trying to make it into this polyprismic thing that they can relish and explore and feel empowered and enlivened by. Um, this is what I was trying to say, that the choice of children's books that are created or translated at any given moment can tell us so very much about what we're trying to create as a as the next generation, as the world of that next generation. So, for example, if you look at very plainly since this week is we're commemorating the, the Holocaust, if you think of what kind of kinds of books were created in Germany at the time or how certain stories were perverted in order to fit a certain ideology at the time. Absolutely, David, you, 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 you're a hundred percent right censorship but also perversion of meaning um, um, creates those specific spaces and translation in that sense instead of becoming a, a, a way to to open up um, minds and spaces and the connections between people become something that's almost very dangerous. Um, the other thing with translation and children's books is what kind of children's experiences do you choose to translate from any given 
culture. So for example, to take Greek children's books, very, very few Greek children's books have made it to a, a, a translated existence, whether you know into German or, or Italian or French or Greek or Spanish or Swedish or I've looked at it. And it is interesting to see what is selected each time. Or for example, if you take um, literature written for other, in, in other cultures, what do we select? What kind of image do we want to transmit as being the image of that culture? And then you, you know, these are points that you, Bruce Upler, and I think um, Harris as well, what kind of manipulation do you exercise on the, 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 the ethnological existence, on the authenticity? What do you define as authenticity? And there are lots of issues with that, especially when you study, for example, foreign languages or modern languages at university, and you say, I'm going to study um, Peruvian literature. Who are you to decide which of the works of Peruvian literature are going to make it into that canon? Mm. Whether you go up or low, you've made a value judgment, exactly the kind of value judgment that a translator makes when they translate poetry, Harris, when they say, you know, the famous sort of um, Oedipus um, King sort of line where it's tiflos tatota tontenunta tomati, that alliteration you know, that choice, do you translate it? The moment you make those choices, whether linguistic, linguistic, stylistic, or cultural, you've included or excluded. I mean, there is no, 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 no sort of um, fine way, fine way of saying it. Thank you. Um, there's actually a question for you here, which ties in um, quite nicely. It's from uh, Fonda van Steen, um, Mika. How hard is it to target a particular age group? And what is your preferred age group? So um, I think each age group has specific needs. And I think you, if you, if, if, if you sort of use the word um, target, you need to understand those needs. So for example, a very young child doesn't necessarily want to play with five different words to say one single thing. It wants to be able to say that single thing. So there is Maria Montessori had a theory that first you start with reality and then you go into enchantment. If you go the other way around, you, you, you create a confusion that destroys actually the very process of imagination. And so each target group has its strengths, weaknesses, and needs and wonder that's a beautiful question um, because the very finest writers for children's books are the ones who understand those things they can go back into their own experience sort of recover those things um, I wouldn't say I have a preferred age group I would say that I have a yearning for books that are good in fact, for any kind of age in the sense that a parent can read them and still engage with them, whether they're reading to a two-year-old toddler or to a five-year-old child or with, you know, um, a 12-year-old sort of, um, there is a book, another book I translated called The Adventures of Hermes, um, God of Thieves, you'd love it, Claire. Um, and so it actually translates the experience of a young child, Hermes, into that of an adult. And you can read that book to a child age four as a night story. And then that child can read that book age seven or eight and discover the world of myths and make it their own and then go on to study it as you did. Thank you. Um, Claire, I think it's this, well, it's specifically for you. Uh, it's a question from Cecily Arthur, who I imagine is in Brussels. Claire, she says, do you think your task of translating is assisted by the fact that you're working in a different language to the original texts? You're, do you feel more free to adapt than a Greek author might um, were they to attempt a similar project? 
what repercussions may that have for someone translating your novels into Greek? Uh, yeah, that's a really interesting question. It's difficult for me to imagine how it might be different if Greek were my natural language. Um, but I think generally it is true that I have quite a large degree of flexibility, um, not just because I'm translating from a different culture, but also from a completely different time. Um, as I say, part of my sort of goal to me is to make these stories accessible and to, to reimagine them in a way that is relatable and engaging to the reader reading it today. So there were many layers of that translation, not just in the, the language being used, but also in, as I said, trying to translate that, that culture and the, the stories that they wanted to tell about themselves in a way that is still interesting and something that we can dig into ourselves and maybe find something that's still relevant to, to our lives. So it, it is a very tangled thing. Um, and of course, you know, I would never claim that my version of telling a certain story is the way it should be told. It's, it's just a, a small part of a much larger tradition, as I said, that's been going on for millennia you know, beyond the culture that originally told those stories of later cultures and cultures in other countries finding meaning and re reshaping those narratives in a way that was then interesting and, and relevant to them. Incidentally, is um, Daughters of Sparta going to be translated into Greek? Uh, not so far. That's not one of the languages that we've got lined up, but it would be it would be interesting, certainly. It could well happen. Um, Claire, sticking with you, because there are two questions here uh, which uh, um, overlap. I'll, I'll read them out. Uh, first of all, um, uh, an anonymous attendee says, do you see the trend of translation of classical texts or sources into fiction continuing? As you said, it's been dominated by female authors on female subjects. Do you see it expanding to other perspectives others' perspectives and other stories. And the other one, Eleni Godi, uh, thank you all for your presentations. In regard to Miss Hayward's presentation, I was really intrigued with her explanation how the rewriting of classical tales in contemporary novels where women assume a central role is one way to tackle the current discussion on decolonizing the canon and the academic curriculum food for thought, she says. What do you, um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I hope that it continues and that it diversifies further. You know, I, I'm telling a particular type of um, a story through a feminist lens, I suppose, but there are certainly other perspectives that would bring very valuable contributions to, to finding meaning in these stories. I, I think that has begun um, already. Um, I mean, there is um, LGBT representation in the, the Song of Achilles, for example, which is um, reframing the, the Iliad as a, a gay love story, essentially. Um, although Madeline Miller herself is not a gay man, but it's, it's interesting how popular that book has been, I think, particularly among LGBT young people um, in sort of maybe seeing a bit of themselves in, in the narrative. Um, I know that there's a book coming out um, by Maya Dean. Um, I think it's called Wrath Goddessing. I apologize if I've got the title wrong, um, which reframes Achilles as a, as a trans woman. Um, again, completely um, bringing a new perspective to an ancient story. Um, and I, I think that all of these takes are valuable, you know, can find an audience. Um, bring something new to it. Um, so there's there's not really a, a limit on where that could go. Um, it's more just about encouraging different voices to, to contribute, I suppose. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that. It raises all sorts of uh, really fascinating questions. Uh, there are, of course, some uh, male novelists uh, doing the same kind of thing. I'm thinking of Colm Tobin, mm -hmm. uh, The House of Names, uh, which does take a, a, a male perspective. It's interesting that you 
you said not a female perspective but a, but a feminist perspective and i, I think that uh, well there's a distinction uh, but it 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 was deliberate yeah i i think from my perspective at least um telling these stories through a feminist or through a female lens in a way necessarily becomes a feminist lens there might be other novelists that would disagree with me and wouldn't classify their texts as feminist um but i think just because of the the tradition that it's building upon and the the way that these stories have previously been interpreted perhaps it is in a way a, a feminist act to then retell them in that different way, not just from a female perspective, but at least in my own writing, using these stories as a kind of vehicle to discuss wider issues, which um, have been a part of female lives mm. from, from the ancient culture up until the modern day. It's, we're not just talking about the story of the Trojan War, it's, it's a vehicle for for thinking about larger things, I think. And that is that is always the case with fiction. There is always more going on than just the, the story that we tell. Um, so that's what I would say. Um, Mika would like to contribute to that. Mika. Um, I just wanted to know, do you know the, the work of Marguerite Yourcenar? She's written a book of fires where she actually picks up female figures, either from classical, mythology or elsewhere and she writes um, their voices and there's an extraordinary monologue that is Clytemnestra's monologue if you want to have a look and there was also yeah. Christa Wolf who did who had another take on Clytemnestra so the interesting thing is that we have actually forgotten how many times the 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 female perspective has been very prominent. And if we actually look at the majority of ancient Greek tragedies or even Roman sort of drama, the most poignant, the most resonant, the most memorable, the most extraordinary voices are the female voices. Yeah, I, I agree. And obviously it's it's those sources that yeah. inspired me to write my own work I mean no it, no the, exactly yeah um it's more it's not so much that those voices haven't been heard I think as I say it's it's about finding a new way to um to find meaning in them um I suppose and as I say to to maybe think about um new issues that might have been there all along but haven't necessarily been been focused on um but yeah, it, it's all part of a, a much larger tradition. As I say, I wouldn't, I wouldn't ever claim that my interpretation is the interpretation. It's just one way of looking at it. Um, there's a question now um, about uh, translation addressed to the two translators in the conventional sense um, on our panel. Do the panelists as translators try to come close and get to know the original authors or do the panelists allow the words themselves to lead the way while viewing the material through their own lens? Another point on authenticity. Charis? Um, thank you, David, for um, this question. And thanks to the participant who has asked the question. Um, from my perspective, being in touch with the poet of of the of the writer of the original poet poem the poet um is is very essential so i i try to get in touch with poets who um, i can approach before i translate a poem they've written um but looking at this question more broadly uh, when it comes to poetry, uh, I would say that uh, I often feel that um, a translator of poetry uh, should be also prepared uh, to translate without uh, being in touch with um, the poet, the writer of the original, because ideally we would like to see 
poems written by authors who are not with us anymore, the long dead, or poems from different uh, eras uh, being brought back to light through modern translations that um, revive them. And uh, I think that that is quite essential, perhaps perhaps more for, for poetry than, than for some other forms of literary expression. Uh, the, the wish to um, survive through time, possibly partly because of its high level of abstraction or um, the quite opaque way uh, often uh, verse um, is, uh, expresses its meaning or the sound and its role in the production of uh, what we would call a poetic experience. But the wish to somehow survive um, the test of time and survive through centuries is quite essential. So when it comes to living poets, yes, definitely get in touch, I would say, if I want to summarize this, but uh, don't let that uh, put you off. Uh, when it comes to translating poems written by people who have been uh, dead for years, because that's also essential for modern poetry. Thank you. Um, Mika, I wonder if you've had the experience of, of translating a living author. Yes, I have had the experience of translating both poetry and fiction with living authors. So um, I think there are two things. Um, there is a duty in, in any Lit well, even in a in a technical translation, you have to understand if it's a technical translation the 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 specific terminology. The same way, when you you're dealing with literary translation or children's books with an author with a creative imagination involved and a creative style and a personal voice, you have to understand. You have to start hearing the echoes in your mind. So that is necessary, whether they're alive or whether they're dead. Whether they're alive is a different issue because then you have to actually check with them. And it's a very interesting process when they, when you produce a translation and the author looks at it and says, well, actually, now that you mention it, I didn't mean that at all. Are you quite sure? There is a, there's a story that um, Mike Healy, told me once, and I think it's a very beautiful one. He was translating the poetry of George Seferis, which he's done quite extraordinarily. And he was um, in Seferis's house and they were discussing one particular sort of um, set of lines. And Mike was insisting, but there should be a coma there. And Seferis would say, no, 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 I, there is no coma in the original. And the debate went on for quite a while to the point that Seferis apparently told his wife, Mero, come on, together with a coffee, bring a comma for the busy, because he's not going to leave me alone. So when you're dealing with a living translation, you've, what Harris very beautifully sort of calls the, 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 the liberties of the translation, the, the, the liberty to express your relationship with the text is quite limited. And one thing with translation is that the whole enchantment of taking a text across is to, to, to take also the relationship between the translator and the author across. And one sees it with great works of art like the Odyssey or the Iliad or the Divine Comedy. If you try and count the number of times that these texts have been translated, it's impossible. And yet we do it again and again and again and again every few years there's going to be a new translation of Homer you know a women's translation of Homer or a man's translation of Homer or a... and why do we do it because we feel that something that person said didn't get through and we have to make sure it does and that's the whole point so I think yes you do need to get to know the the authors whether alive or dead you need to understand the, the, the human voice and the human experience and the, the sort of soul in this. Um, Harris, uh, perhaps uh, you could answer this question from Richard Devereux. Um, 
what were the main challenges you faced in, in translating Fiona Benson's Ariadne, which is a difficult poem. Uh, and I wonder whether translation is the appropriate term for uh, the process that you went through, as opposed to rewriting, recasting or something else, reworking. Thank you very much, um, David, and uh, many thanks to Richard Devere for, for this question. Um, I was very pleased to work on Fiona Benson's Ariadne. A uh, lot of challenges, as um, beautifully put by um, David. Um, I was uh, relieved to see at the beginning that uh, the poem was written in free verse because in some respects that uh, makes the translation easier in some respects and uh, saves one from a number of difficult decisions but then difficulties emerged uh, later well difficulties in the sense of um, quite uh, interesting challenges rather than uh, unpleasant situations but they had to do with the fact that uh, Ariadne and the Minotaur are very present in uh, modern Greek literature and uh, you can find their shadows uh, or their actual stories uh, expressed in poetic terms by a number of poets who have left their mark in how um, a knowledgeable reader of modern Greek poetry would ever engage uh, with um, the myth of Ariadne and the Minotaur um, and other um, stories from Greek uh, mythology. So it was important for me to translate the poem in a way that would um, respect the uh, meaning, uh, the content of the poem produced by, by Fiona. Uh, but it was also important to uh, host her poem in a Greek tradition that has its own legacy on how Ariadne and Minotaur uh, and other characters of the story are represented. So in some respects, I think I tried with what David uh, described earlier as a recreation. Uh, and I try to do that in a legitimate way that wouldn't challenge um, the key aspects of the content of Fiona's poems. Trying to find uh, those uh, parts of the poem, uh, lines, uh, images that are quite opaque, quite um, dark in terms of their possible interpretation, and favor in such cases a meaning or more specifically, uh, a linguistic trans transmission, a use of the language that would do all to justice to how this story has been represented by Greek uh, poets um, in, uh, say, the last um, two centuries, which are the most active in terms of modern uh, Greek poetry production. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, there's a question now from uh, Dimitris Diovas. Um, do you see the task of the translator as making the translated text more accessible to a foreign audience? Uh, he says, for example, Kazan Zakis's Odyssey reads better in the English translation of Kimon Friar than it does in the original Greek. Uh, do you favor the addition of explanatory notes in the translation, he asks? Um, Again, I think it's uh, Mika and uh, uh, Harris, but of course, Claire can also uh, uh, chip in with her own thoughts on this. And by the way, I, I might just remind people if they have questions, if they could put them in the Q&A uh, function, uh, not in the chat function, because they won't be noticed there, I'm afraid. Uh, so there is still time for more questions. So let's go back to this one posed by uh, Dimitris Diovas, the task of the translator um, and, and whether it, it uh, can actually sometimes make a text more accessible. Who would like to start with that? Mika, 
I think that's a choice. I think every translator, first of all, has a publisher saying what they want. But also, if it's a self motivated translation, you do have to decide whether you're trying to, what you're trying to get across. And there's, there's another question that, that sort of picks up on this and says, is it even possible to translate? I mean, in absolute terms, no. And, 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 yes, in, there is a solipsistic um, axiom in every kind of human utterance. What I say will come into your ears a certain way, will be filtered by your own understanding. So not necessarily 100% of what I said will be what you understand. The same holds true with translation. So in absolute terms, no, we cannot 100% translate perfectly and purely and, and absolutely. But we do make choices. And I think when it comes to what can be termed difficult texts or idiosyncratic texts or texts that are complex in the sense that they try to to work on many levels. Kazantakis is one, um, um, Lewis Carroll's says Jabberwocky may be another, or um, James Joyce's Ulysses or Finnegan's Wake might be even another. Um, every single time you make a choice, how much you can take from one space to another. And with the question of Kazantakis in particular, what is lost in any translation is the angst that Kazantakis had with language, the angst to create a new language that did not just reject the purest reconstruction of a language that had a dynamic evolution, a tradition of growth, as opposed to, be, to being a sort of a static mausoleum of itself. So that is lost. In, in any translation, whether it's Kim and Fryer's or anyone else's. What is transmitted more easily, and this is, I think, what um, Professor Diovis is trying to say, is that the story comes across. The, 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 the elements, the multiplicities of layers of meaning, those come across. But the personal angst that Cousin Zach has had, the, the politics of the language that he's trying to use, the history of the language that he's trying to use, the social moment and his own sort of ambiguities, that unfortunately is lost. So, and that's part of the process of translating. There's, you know, if, you know, even when it is an adaptation, you leave something behind and you prioritize something else. It's like having a camera. You frame, you will always frame. Um, something will be outside the frame, some, something will be within the frame. But you could have your own paratext uh, in the form of uh, footnotes or a, a lengthy introduction. Exactly. Introduction. Exactly. So again, it depends on the kind of translation. So a children's book will probably suffer if there are too many footnotes and too much sort of critical apparatus involved. A, if you're reading Tolstoy's War and Peace, another text that has been translated multi, multiple times, the footnotes in those cases, whether it has to do with language or history or, or the choices of the translator, can create a paratextual or metasexual experience that is as enriching in many ways as reading the text itself, and it can be an extraordinary thing. Alice, do you have any anything to add to that? Thank you, David, and, and thank you, Mika. Um, yes, uh, that's an interesting uh, uh, question. Thanks to uh, Dimitris Jovas. Uh, I would say personally that uh, making the original more more accessible um, to the reader of of my uh, translations is, is is not very um, high on my list of, of aims, uh, but that's uh, merely because uh, I mostly translate from languages that um, are uh, pretty popular in Greece, so people can easily access the original, say for instance English, and 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 get a sense of the actual meaning. So uh, I see that translation from Kemp's mic is translating into Greek as a form um, of um, a respectful recreation uh, of the of the original. But I believe that things would be different if I were to translate from, uh, say, Greek to, to English. I suppose that's uh, uh, 
making the uh, original more accessible to a wider audience would be would be um, you know even higher in my uh, list of aims. But um, regarding explanatory notes, again, uh, I think it depends. Uh, I agree with uh, with with Mika who highlighted different different types uh, of of translation. It depends on the type of translation. Um, we we all need uh, translations uh, produced by very good scholars who um, would try to communicate to the reader not only the uh, meaning of the translated text, but uh, also the whole cultural ambience uh, of the poet uh, of his or her era of uh, the broader um, culture uh, at the time the poem was produced. But when it comes to um, a poet who is not a scholar translating uh, poetry, I would say that explanatory notes um, are not perhaps the most significant uh, contribution uh, because they may uh, invite a reading that uh, places um, quite a bit of emphasis on what I described earlier as cognitive or semantic, the content of the poem, and uh, put less emphasis on something else that is uh, equally important, comes to sound, comes to uh, the uh, language of poetry, which uh, I think Mika also um, summarized very well in an earlier question by talking about enchantment. So sometimes explanatory notes uh, could not um, allow as much uh, room for, for enchantment. Thank you. There, there is a question that sort of follows on. It's about the problems of, of translating Homer. Um, I don't know whether, Harris, you've ever tried to translate uh, Homer, but Peter Pond says, is translation of poetry from one language to another beyond difficult, even to the point of impossible? Uh, have yet to translate one stanza of tonic ancient Greek of Homer to stress modern English as a dactylic hexameter with any success. Finding enough dactyls is only the first problem. <laughs> Puns, onomatopoeia, words such as uh, xenos uh, leave one always wanting, am I alone? Thank you, David. Um, shall, shall I try to reply to this question? Or? Yes, please, if okay. you have an answer. Okay. Is there an okay. answer? Just give up in despair. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, yes, well, thank you very much to um, to Peter Bourne for this question. I, I have an answer which ties somehow to, to what I mentioned earlier about different types of translator. Uh, I think Omer and uh, other, uh, like the Odyssey, if they had other classical texts are, um, uh, present huge challenges uh, for a poet uh, who is not a scholar to translate uh, to translate them. I wouldn't uh, engage myself uh, with um, uh, with texts of that um, uh, sort of length of tradition. Uh, but uh, I believe that um, we can have very uh, reliable reliable translations by uh, scholars when it comes to these texts, which will find a way uh, to, to balance the challenges that uh, are very, you know, very well uh, highlighted in, in Peter's comment. But that should not put off uh, poets who want to just uh, recreate uh, key points of key themes from these uh, works uh, into, uh, through, through trying to translate them more in the form of um, adapting them uh, rather than the form of literal translation. I'd like to highlight here Michalis Ganassis, uh, who's a major living Greek poet, uh, translations in inverted commas, uh, transmissions or readaptations of the Odyssey and the Iliad, uh, which were recently published. So I think that is a good example of how a poet can somehow leave behind such really difficult challenges um, and try uh, to communicate uh, his or her feeling of um, response, literary response to these works uh, through reproducing, not through reproducing me, excuse me, through recreating them uh, in, in his or her own um, way. Thank you. Um, Mika, did you want to add anything? Um, I actually did have to tackle translating Homer, but not as a translator, uh, because um, my doctorate was based on how Crisis in the 1930s had looked back at Homer as a paradigm for everything they were trying to to sort of come to terms with as 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 a way of 
finding a way beyond the crisis of the interwar period. And I did not want to use other people's translation precisely because I wanted to engage with Homer at the most fundamental level to get to know him as much as I could. And what I realized, even when it was just translation for the meaning rather than for the meter or for the stylistics, um, is what I realized was the richness of content in each word that he uses, not just because there are five words to translate a word he uses, but because he puts five different layers of meaning in each word. And if you listen, you know, um, oligonte filonte, for example, that tiny thing that I love, how do you translate that? That one tiny thing that is so precious to me, that single person that makes my life, you know, worthwhile. It's three words, oligonte filonte, four words. It's, there is a richness that is extraordinary. Or you look at the choices, the linguistic choices that he makes when it comes to attributives. There is not a single positive adjective when it comes to war or when it comes to battle or when it comes to dying in battle. He never glorifies war. And you'd think that in you know, 12 solid books, all those lines, he must have slipped once in a while. He has not. There is not a single adjective that says, you know, the glorious, yes. And all these things are significant and you can only come to see them if you create that incredibly intimate relationship with Homer and his works through the act of translation. And you have to be humble and you have to listen and you have to be weary of imposing meanings but it is an extraordinary thing. So um, yes, you can and you cannot. Again, it's, it's that, that constant ambiguity that is at the heart of all translation. There is a comment here, uh, rather than a question, I think, uh, from one of our viewers in Miami, Florida, um, Aphrodite Alexandrakis. And she says it's addressed to Claire, but I think it has wider implications. So I would like to open it up after uh, Claire has, has responded. I, I think that certain Platonic books, such as the Laws, Aristotle's Ethics, and the Greek Tragedies, would help understanding the important role women played not only in the classical times, such as Spartan and Athenian women, but even as far as the Mycenaean goddesses. Um, I, I think. The, the question that this opens up is to what extent does the translator or, or the novelist more particularly here need to read around the subject, um, even to the point of reading philosophy perhaps, in order to really un understand, in order to see what makes those characters tick and then locate them in the right social context. Um, that probably, Claire, um, is something that you have done. And I don't know whether you could give us an idea of how you go about researching the background to your novels. Um, yeah, I, I thank you for the comment from the, the contributor. Um, it is a, a balancing act, which is something we've we've come back to again and again. But um, I, I always have to tell myself that I am not a, an academic. I'm not researching for a, a thesis. I'm trying to tell an engaging story. So while I do I do considerable careful research, um, there has to also be a limit to that. I can't possibly understand everything that has ever been written about you know women in ancient Greece for example um, but I, I balance my research between uh, reading ancient sources um, in the case of Daughters of Sparta that was primarily um, Homer and Greek tragedies um, and a few other things um, like Gorgias's Encomium of Helen, something like that, um, and also later reception of those same stories from writers like Ovid um, and later on. Mm -hmm. um, so I read the, 
the sort of canon literature that was produced on those subjects. And then the other side of my research, like you say, is to try to understand the, the social historical context that those characters might have existed in. Um, and, that, and that's particularly important for me because of the, the way that I tell my stories, they, they are quite, um, there's a lot of realism in my style and um, they are not fantasy stories. Um, I try to set them more within a, a real historical world. Um, so I do uh, quite a lot of research on archeology span um, and other um, written texts that might tell us more about the, the reality of people living in, in the period that these stories might have originated in. Um, and I, I love the aspect of um, writing a novel. I, I love the research stage, but as I say, at some point you have to draw a line and prioritize what you're trying to achieve um, and what you're trying to transmit to your reader. Um, you could do all the research in the world, but are they gonna get much more out of that? Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a balancing act. Uh, and, and sometimes there are difficult choices, whether you go with one version or another version of the same story, presumably. Uh, Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I try to read all the different versions and then come up with my own, that is an amalgam, um, but also my own feeling. It's, it's, it is inherently a, a personal thing to, to write fiction, I think, and you always put some of yourself in it and your own anxieties and your own personality. Um, so yeah, again, it's, it's threading together a very long and rich tradition with your own input. Um, that's how I approach it. Mika, perhaps uh, you want to add something? Um, I had a very curious thought for Claire. So in a way, you are not actually translating the, the Greeks or the Romans. They are translating you in a little bit. This sort of a, this kind of very beautiful, quirky manner. I love your, your notion of a balancing act, and I think that's right. And I also think that there is a huge responsibility to, um, and that I think picks up on many points that you were making, David. There's a huge responsibility to make a distinction between using something as a foil for one's own thoughts and desires and perspectives and stories and adaptation where you actually do have to keep a, a substantial amount of the skeleton so that it's still the same beast rather than a, a, a sort of head of a crow and the body of a lion and the legs of a crocodile or whatever so you need you need that judicious choice between what you can do and what you may do and the finest writers find that balance there are you know Kazantakis was mentioned before he has written actually books that adapt um, the classical tradition there are two children's books um, that were very famous in Greece at, the, at, at a certain time. One is at the palaces of Knossos and the other one is um, Alexander. Uh, um, and he, he retells a story. He puts every single ounce on himself in that, but he still respects the, the basic skeleton of the beast. Um, so I think, there is, I think there is so much richness in what we sometimes dismissively call the, the canon, the Western canon. And there is so much to, that we can take to help us create something that is radically new, but with that continuity that makes it meaningful. And I think when it comes to canons, the best thing you can do is enrich them rather than simply obliterate them and replace them with something then you lose the most important thing of any kind of tr truly free society, which is dialecticity. You need to bring in, not burn at the stake and then erect new totem sort of gods. So um, I'm particularly pleased that people who are much younger than I am um, 
a sort of finding that way to be a very fruitful one. And I have not read your book, but I, I should perhaps. Um, Harris, does this uh, impinge at all on your experiences as a, as a poet and uh, as a reader, in fact? Um, Thank you, um, David. Uh, yes, it, it, it definitely does, um, both as a, as a reader and as a translator uh, of poetry or as a poet. Um, I would say that, uh, well, poetry retains, uh, in some respects, something from its uh, legendary past, its legendary ancient past, where the poet uh, was, in some respects, sort of the uh, magician or the wizard of the of the tribe, and uh, articulated through uh, poetry, through sort of beautiful words and sounds, uh, the actual truth about everything in the world. <laughs> of course, that is um, uh, not uh, realistic if taken uh, in literal terms uh, nowadays. But uh, it can be used as um, a point of reference. Uh, which, if understood as a metaphor, perhaps can, can teach us something. And that is that um, a poet should normally have an interest uh, in knowledge from all different fields. Uh, philosophy, of course, but also religion, um, history. Uh, I would say even the natural sciences, so that uh, we know where the metaphor about the natural world begins and where the findings of um, scientific research more recently uh, make things that are real also sound miraculous. Uh, so I think an awareness of the broader scope of knowledge is very important because it enables someone who writes poetry both to uh, retain something of this old uh, legendary past, but also to somehow tune himself or herself with uh, the actual truth which is, in some respects, the mirror uh, in which poems project themselves. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we are running out of time now, I'm afraid. So um, I would like to thank our, our three speakers for their very informative responses, their presentations, and then the way they have answered the various questions that have been uh, put to them, I, I think we've uh, seen various complementary skills uh, in play this week, and we'll see different approaches perhaps in the uh, panel that uh, we'll be meeting one week uh, from today. But I can certainly say that the three speakers today have uh, very fruitfully engaged with, with this theme and brought out all, all sorts of interesting uh, aspects of it. So. Warmest thanks to all three of them, Claire, uh, Mika, and uh, Harris. Thanks also to the, the two um, bodies which have sponsored this event, the British School at Athens and uh, the uh, uh, Centre for Hellenic Studies at uh, King's College London. Thanks also to Aora Books, who uh, have also been associated with, with these events and the, and the previous ones.